The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. Good crack noon to our friends on the East Coast and uh, even the Nova Scotians. Not sure if uh, we have anybody from Nova Scotia, <laughs> but if so, welcome. Um, I am Todd Obert, along with uh, Pete Greco from Productive, and we are going to talk about uh, the essential need for cyber training to, uh, you know, improve or strengthen your security posture. Uh, if you have been on our events before, you know how we do it. We meet Productive in one minute, and then we get right into it. Pete's going to talk about email security, passwords, uh, home user security, the phone, and all the things you need to do relative to training to make sure your end users are not your number one threat factor. So with that, let's uh, get me rolling so we can get it over on to Mr. Greco. Well, who is Productive Corporation? Well, I'm very glad you asked, even though you're muted. Uh, Productive Corporation provides <laughs> solutions for mid-sized companies. We have a bunch of specialized expertise. We can help with your technical and licensing questions. We also implement, test, and optimize everything that we do. We do security assessments. We do AD security services. We can do configuration assistance and UTM services. We also produce a lot of third-party content. All of that can be found on ProductiveCorp.com uh, forward slash solving security. Uh, the bottom line is we can help you. So help at Productive Corp. Uh, if you want to, give us a call on the rotary phone, 612-375-0204. Uh, but more importantly, email help at ProductiveCorp.com for anything uh, that goes to the key team, and we will respond. So with that, we're going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Pete Greco. Pete, uh, are you ready to rock this thing? Let's do it. Yeah. Um, all right. I am going to uh, make you presenter. While you're doing that, please email me a picture, everybody, of your desktop rotary phone, and I will gladly send you a uh, $5 Starbucks card. Uh, but it's got to be a real one that you're using. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me make sure I'm actually showing my correct screen. Todd, can you see me? I can see the correct screen. Awesome. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hopping on. It's very special to us when you guys take time out of your busy days to, to join us. We do really appreciate it. I will try and make great use of our time together. Let's get into it. There's basically you know, three real goals for hackers, nation state advancement, stealing our secrets for their benefit, making money and hacktivism. And really hacktivism is probably the one that we see the least, but it is out there. And if you're uh, maybe a, a nonprofit or you've got a government website, uh, it's potentially something that you gotta be on the lookout for. It doesn't matter though why you're a target, just know everybody is. Uh, we talk to many folks who think that they're off the hook because they don't have sensitive data. Uh, and, and really, whether you do or whether you don't, everybody's at risk for compromise for lots of different reasons. It's not just stealing credit cards and, and uh, HIPAA-related data, though that's stuff to worry about, uh, but that's not the only thing that, that uh, these bad guys are after. So many ways for hackers to make gains ransoming your network, selling your data, using your network to uh, crypto mine or be a botnet, selling your identity or the clean identities of students who maybe they're not even 18 yet, so haven't had a chance to get bad credit. Uh, that stuff is gold mines on the dark web. And it's all fair game to hacking organizations. And it translates into real money uh, for criminals and rogue states like North Korea, who is funding their nuclear program partially through cybercrime, you know, and so that's money and espionage uh, that, that's happening. Attack vectors are opening up 
but email continues to be the leader by far. But this past year, we've seen a lot more stuff happening via uh, USB and uh, direct web attacks and, and uh, penetration attacks, but still email really continues to be uh, the widest uh, uh, use of, of initial compromise, um, right? So our first step in protecting our house is a mesh security program uh, that's gonna include uh, sandboxing and URL rewriting, anti-malware analysis, uh, post-delivery search and destroy for both inbound and outbound mail. It's not uncommon for us to talk to folks who are running uh, good mail security, but I'm always surprised at how many folks have not taken the extra step to flick on the outbound protection. You wanna make sure that if a machine does get compromised, you're not the spammer, right? And even with all of this good stuff that's available, and we can help you if you don't have a current solution or your current solution is lacking, we still see email slip through. And so our next step is to get our end users on the same page with what's going on, educating them to take a close look at certain emails while not looking at all at others. Uh, for example, shipping refunds. If you're not in the shipping department or you haven't shipped anything, uh, right, clicking on that uh, uh, refund PDF or that invoice or whatever, why? You know it's not for you, uh, right? Uh, quote requests. Are you even in sales? Uh, clients that you've never heard of aren't combing LinkedIn to find your email to try and buy stuff from somebody who's not even on the sales team. And we see a lot of those, uh, but a lot of times it's for stuff like water pumps. Uh, we're not in that business. Don't Don't even look at it. It doesn't require a close look because it's not even applicable to us yeah. uh, right my favorite of what's that todd i don't know if you have data on this but it seems like that was a a huge threat vector that these end users even though they weren't working in shipping or whatever department they were you know curious of what other happenings were and so they'd click yeah. these things uh, it, and i think yeah, so we have previ on a previous webinar, and I should have put that in here, Todd. I wish I would have thought of it. Um, we actually had some stats about uh, why people click uh, on some of these emails, and a lot of it comes down to curiosity, but there's a, a small percentage, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think it was around 15% of people who think that if they click on something that's going to be bad, they can stop it in time. And a lot of times you're already too late. And the second you release that mouse button, it's already too late. You're not gonna be able to cancel out. It's not like when you're gonna install software and you get to the spot where you can do next or cancel. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> way too quick. So it can be curiosity. It can be, I just wanna see what's going on and I'm gonna stop it before anything happens. And some folks are just getting fooled and. And I recall my, my mom uh, getting an email where uh, Bill Gates wanted her to forward this email to all of her friends. And, and if they hit 100,000 people or something crazy, then everybody was going to get 10 grand. Well, you know, at that time, the guy had 100,000 employees. He didn't need my mom's help to test out email. They, they had plenty of people who just worked at Microsoft that he could make them. <laughs> do that right and she was just like well what's the worst that could happen well total compromise is the worst that could happen uh, <laughs> so let's let's avoid that right uh, some of my favorites uh, uh, of course is emails to change your password I think everybody on this call probably knows that's not how you get notified when it's time to change your password it usually happens when you're logging into your email or the network or uh, Office 365 or whatever it is you're using, you don't get emailed proactively, hey, it's time, your password's expiring. Uh, it's happening at login time. That's something that folks need to get educated on. Uh, the other one that I'm a big fan of, of course, is the mailbox full messages. And uh, I, I like this one because it, in exchange, you can uh, uh, hit the wall, right, when your user hits their storage limit. But unfortunately, it's not as easy to fix as just dropping them out in automated email, uh, right? We, we maybe all wish it actually worked that way, but in fact, it doesn't. And the only way the end user can really fix that themselves is 
by deleting some of those joke of the day emails from 2003 and freeing up a little a little space, right? So again, educating them on what's legit, how to look out for things that are legit is uh, really our, our best bet. The first thing is let's filter that down, eliminate as much as we can with great email security. And the next step is we need the end user to be able to look at some emails like this and recognize no marketing person is gonna send out an email this way. Uh, no automated renewal is gonna include uh, dashes and tildes and, and this kind of stuff uh, when they're a legit organization trying to, you know, trying to earn your business. Uh, the other thing that, that we wanna do is figure out if the sender even makes any sense. Now, I'm a, a, actually a Simply Safe user myself, uh, right? I, I know from doing business with them, uh, but even if I didn't, I'd be able to figure it out that uh, they're not using the skin care for products for men uh, domain. That that would be a money saver if you merge those two businesses together from a marketing standpoint, but not how it actually works. And I think when you start getting folks to realize, oh, okay, I can start looking at some of this stuff and figuring out this is not from the right people. The other interesting thing on this email is there's no individual links or information. It's one graphic. No matter where you click, it's taking you to the same malicious website, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, so you're, as you're uh, highlighting over this, and again, on, on this email, a little bit different, same deal though, no matter where I hover my mouse, I'm seeing it's from the food fashionista which is not who the email is from. So we need to be on the lookout for that kind of stuff, right? Here's a big one, and definitely through COVID, uh, we saw a big uptick in emails with uh, COVID information and uh, uh, PPE gear and, and this kind of stuff uh, that folks were desperate to learn more about, desperate to get their hands on masks and uh, N95 masks especially and, and this kind of stuff. And so a lot of that kind of information was getting leveraged. But again, as you highlight over it, you can see it's not going to the right website. That's the kind of stuff we need to uh, understand how to identify if this is actually good information or bad information. There's a couple different ways. It's the sender, it's the link that it's actually going to, and that's gonna help us really figure out what's going on. Now, here's an email that I had actually gotten that I was I, I spent a little time, and that's why I incorporated into this of trying to figure out, well, is this real? Because it it sounded familiar, and as it turned out, it was a place where I had uh, purchased something from, I think, for my brother. And as I moved around, what I could see, and, and unfortunately, you can't see it. There we go. You can see it's actually the links are are referencing Moose Jaw, which is where it's from. Now they're giving out uh, free ten dollars in exchange for doing a survey. That's not so much that it's ridiculous, but still something that I wanna be suspicious on. So as I highlight over these links though, then I'm seeing that they all have a Moose Jaw link, but they're not all the same link. So the unsubscribe is unsubscribing for Moose Jaw, but it's a different unsubscribe link from the survey and from some of the other stuff. So a couple easy ways that you can figure out what's going on. And then as I Google that, the next step that you can do then is, is Google that site to figure out if it's legit and they come up with a real website. Here's what their uh, domain is. I'm able to cross-reference that and figure out, okay, this actually is legit. I am interested in it. If you have no interest in it though, the safest thing, delete it. Whether it's legit or not, if it doesn't pertain to you, you're not interested in it, delete it. It requires no investigation at all. And then the next thing is, let's use a little common sense. Uh, my Chase account is getting suspended. Do I even bank at Chase? Uh, I got caught on one, I, I didn't get caught, uh, but it got my attention, an issue with my American Express account, and I do have an American Express account, but it came to my Productive Corp email, that's not the email that I use for my personal uh, finances and, and banking, so pretty quickly uh, able to delete that without even opening the email, uh, right? So that's kind of some of the stuff, and, and again, here's one from Wells Fargo, we go down here, we can see not from the right place, uh, if if I am concerned about my Wells Fargo or my Chase or my Amex account or whatever, the safest thing to do, of course, is just pull up the browser, go to wellsfargo.com, go to chase.com. If you have an issue with your account, there's going to be a secure message in there. You don't have to go through the email to get there, uh, right? 
the next thing where we're getting jammed up, and I know from talking to uh, a lot of you folks and, and our customer base in general, uh, passwords just a, a huge uh, headache, especially from the typical end user. Uh, why can't I use the same password uh, everywhere? Why do I have to change my password uh, all the time? Why does it got to be uh, 11 or 12 or 15 di or whatever you're making me do and a symbol? You know, why, why does it have to be this way? And a lot of people feel like, well, the safest thing is if I can have a complex password, but I use the same thing everywhere. And the unfortunate part of that is when passwords get stolen. Right, the uh, hacker is able to come back and say, uh, well, let's see if this person's got a Gmail account. Uh, here's their corporate email, so I'm gonna see if I can log into their VPN or, or log into their firewall or uh, remote desktop access. Uh, can I log into a bank account? And they're not sitting at their computer typing this stuff out. They're using a program that's gonna be able to try that username and password on thousands of websites looking for a way to compromise the individual or that organization. Here's one of the things that uh, I found very interesting. Uh, this is from uh, an article on Tech Republic. Uh, you can find that if you just Google uh, password strength Tech Republic and read the article is, is pretty interesting. But thanks to uh, modern graphics processing cards, uh, they're able, hackers are able to compromise uh, even complex passwords more quickly than ever. And you can see some interesting uh, stats here, right? Anything under uh, really 10 or 11 characters, depending on uh, what mix of complexity you're adding in there, pretty, pretty quick. And at six digits, nothing is complex enough, uh, or really seven, uh, what do we got here? 39 minutes, two days. So really at nine digits, nothing complex enough for your account to not be compromised uh, quite rapidly. And if they've stolen the password, they've got you. That's why we need to change passwords frequently and use different passwords all over the place. So my recommendation to everybody is enforce a 13 digit number, upper and lower case uh, password at the minimum. For myself personally, I'm typically using passwords that are in the 20 character range or the maximum of what that website will allow. I do see a lot of websites where uh, 16 or 18 characters might be the max. I'm setting it up there and I'm going as complex as I can to get up into this into this range. And again, using a different password at every single website. Uh, that way if it gets stolen, they don't have this password in, in clear text. And if they get this password, you know, the again, uh, they're going to feed this into a program. They're not just going to try and log on at Gmail. They're going to try and log on at Netflix. They're going to try and log on at uh, the 100 largest banks, probably some additional ones, the hardest, uh, 100 largest credit card companies. And at some point, they're going to figure out that they've gotten into some place and they're going to be stealing money and, and data. The best thing to do here, obviously, is get a password manager to help you track. I think I have uh, roughly 570 logons. I've been using password management for uh, quite a long time. I don't know if you remember, uh, Todd, when we first started using, I can't even remember what that original application was called. It might have just been called passwords, uh, right? So I've got a lot of logins and it's pretty handy when I log on to a site that I haven't been to in a year or a couple of years, but it's very handy at generating new passwords and tracking them for the sites that I'm actively using both internal and external. And when you hear of a data breach for a site that you use frequently or know you use, especially like a Facebook or a LinkedIn or an Office 365 or any one of these, it's a great time to go out and proactively change passwords and educate folks on why. If they stolen in the password. Your password manager might notify you of that. For sure, yeah. And that's, when I see that, that, that's one of the I great take things. action the immediately. Dashlane or LastPass, they they even kind of tell you these pa these sites have been compromised. Change your password for these sites. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a it's a great uh, <laughs> it's a great advice to follow. And on your uh, most sensitive websites, even changing them proactively, I like to change my uh, passwords uh, at least every six months on all my banking websites. And I'm using something really even a little bit longer than this 
to try and fool folks. But this is what we're looking for. And if you're using a password manager, it really doesn't matter what it is because you're not gonna try and memorize this anyway. And for me anyway, no matter how many times I type this in, I'm never gonna memorize it. I'm not gonna use it in multiple places, uh, right? And again, some websites can't handle that. So even something like this with enough characters is gonna get you to where you need to be. And then of course, uh, and this really isn't new, but uh, gaining popularity, partially in th uh, in, thanks to cyber insurance requiring a uh, second factor or MFA, but getting uh, two-factor authentication, MFA, SSO in your environment, if you don't already have it, goes a long way. So you got a complex password and you've got a second allow or deny or a six-digit code or whatever it might be, uh, it might be a, a, a biometric, uh, dongle that you're touching, whatever it is, if the hacker can't get access to uh, both of those methods, and the only way that they're going to be able to is with uh, physical theft, which could happen, uh, right? Or, or uh, somebody takes you hostage, they're probably going to get access to your account. But uh, those stories are pretty few and far between. Most of this stuff is uh, obviously happening uh, remotely, and uh, two factor really goes uh, a long way. Uh, security questions. You know, the, the big trick with security questions is a lot of this stuff is easy to uncover on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, what school did you go to? Uh, right? That's, that's probably on your Facebook profile. Uh, if you went to a high school reunion, that information is going to be uh, found out. If you've done anything with your college, that information is going to be found out. Your kids' name. E easy stuff to find out, right? Uh, your favorite car, there's a lot of guesses that are pretty quick to figure out. What I've started doing to try and uh, change it up a little bit is putting special characters. Uh, I had uh, one, one guy suggest using uh, pizza pizza for everything. The security questions are getting smart enough that they won't let you use the same answer for multiple questions. So that doesn't work for you anymore. So I've started using the real answer, but adding special characters in in specific spots. That way I know the answer, I know where to put the special characters. A hacker is not going to be able to reset my password remotely and gain access by guessing some of my security questions or social engineering me to get at those security questions. So uh, an another thing you can help folks uh, uh, understand. Todd mentioned uh, LastPass and Dashlane, which we use uh, internally here. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, is anyone uh, better than the next? You can make your own decision on that whatever you think is easy to roll out for your organization and get your employees to really start using and get educated on uh, is going to be a great solution. It's going to be better than nothing. All of these can hold thousands and thousands of passwords. They generate them for you automatically. You can copy and paste them. They autofill on the website. So in a lot of cases, using a password manager actually saves you a ton of time over manually typing in uh, a password free and paid versions available. Typically a paid version is gonna let you use that password application on multiple devices. So I have, and I know Todd does as well, I have mine on my phone, I have it on my work computer, I have it on my home computer, I can gain access wherever I'm at. The data is encrypted on my machine. It's not stored in the cloud, it's stored on each individual device, they sync together. So I don't have to worry about, can I trust LastPass, can I trust Dashlane? They're not holding my data and it's all encrypted by me with one password to remember that gives me access to all of that. And again, I wanna make it something that's super complex. I like to go with a complex phrase where I'm mixing in uh, numbers and, and uh, caps and, and lowercase, uh, right, in a, in a smart way that helps me remember it. Uh, also makes it hard to guess uh, when you look at it initially, it just looks like a bunch of, uh, of random stuff, uh, right? Uh, home security. Big challenge for a lot of our customers is uh, they've got folks that are uh, working from home, maybe full time now, uh, right? But maybe they're doing extra work at, uh, in the evening. If they're taking their work machine home, hopefully your security technology is following them. Uh, what I do a lot of the times is I'm using my home machine to access network resources or uh, Office 365 in the cloud or, or whatever to, to knock some stuff out, or I'm using my phone. Uh, very important to get folks to understand the benefit of having a solid endpoint security solution at home. 
uh, right, making sure, especially if they live in a, a dense area like I do and like Todd does, uh, maybe it's an apartment building, uh, it's in the middle of the city, uh, whatever, where uh, your Wi-Fi signal spreads beyond your domicile, uh, right, using a complex password on your pass on your router, uh, changing the default password if you're a Comcast or a CenturyLink or uh, Cox or whatever. Uh, right, they deliver those uh, routers. A lot of times they've got a default password. I've seen more and more where they're randomizing the password and taping it to the bottom of the router uh, for additional security, but making sure that's the case and helping them understand why, uh, protecting their Macs. So I know a lot of folks think that nothing bad could ever happen on a Mac. Um, not the case, as it turns out. Uh, just recently heard of a customer who had been hacked on a mainframe malware on their mainframe that's a first uh right things are spreading uh they're crossing more than windows plenty of linux attacks plenty of mac attacks make sure those macs are are protected and help them understand uh to get patching turned on for uh the uh, business organization using a centrally managed patch apparatus is the way to go for a home user get live update turned on it goes a long way uh, right, and, and periodically looking at uh, your installed programs list and removing stuff that you don't need or use removes vulnerabilities from hackers, and it's some easy stuff that home users can do and can figure out on their own. Uh, one of the big ones that we see a lot of times elderly people are the victims, but not exclusively, are the phone scams, uh, right? My, my favorite is when someone's calling me, their business is going bankrupt, and they're going to give me a refund. Uh, I don't think anybody's ever gotten their money back in the history of the world from an organization that went bankrupt, uh, right? The, the, the key thing there is they have no more money. Uh, why would they be giving you a refund, right? Or we're going out of business. We're just giving you all your money. Doesn't work that way. Uh, meet with an IRS agent to settle your, your tax debt. Uh, meet with a police officer with a handful of cash. That's not how bail works, <laughs> right? That's not how you pay fines. That, that's not how any of this stuff works. Don't give out any info, including account info, and really think about uh, how you're engaging with this folks and get your, your employees to think about how we're engaging with these folks, the questions they're asking me, the things that they're telling me, is it adding up, uh, right? And that's gonna help you avoid scams at home and scams at the office, and we have heard of just a ton of situations where somebody's getting a phone call from the CEO or the VP or whatever, they need $10,000 in iTunes gift cards or some other kind of Amazon gift cards uh, to pay an invoice or make an acquisition. Nobody's bought a business ever using iTunes gift cards. Uh, and I'll just tell you guys, we don't accept those as payment. <laughs> Nobody does except for Apple. Uh, right, so no, uh, no, no iTunes cards, but we're considering <laughs> Dogecoin. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, a, a lot of information here. How can Productive Corp help you? Uh, right, we can help you evaluate your email security program. Make sure we get you into a solid solution there. We can help you uh, evaluate web security. And one of the most important things, you know, forever, folks have been doing that on the firewall. Get something on the endpoint that follows that end user wherever they go. And one of the top recommendations there, block free mail. So you put in uh, mail security, but you're allowing them to go to Hotmail or Outlook.com or Gmail or whatever, where you've got no protection. Now you're inviting uh, malware that maybe is easily defeatable on your corporate network into the corporate network through a free mail. Most folks can check their email on their phone uh, or on their home machine make sure you're keeping it off the, the corporate network. And of course, cyber training, we have a couple of different uh, really neat uh, cyber training solutions. We'd love to show you how they work and, and how you can use them internally to keep your folks going. The first step is to buy one of those. The next step is to use it on a continuous basis. It's not one and done, it's do it monthly, do it quarterly, make sure all of your users are getting hit multiple times a year. In addition to these things, MFA, SSO, get that network patched. We can help you out with XDR, EDR, gateway, uh, data recovery, cloud monitoring, all kinds of stuff. We'd love to talk to you more about upping your security game. 
that's all I got, Todd. I, I liked it. I like how you kind of uh, just let that slide roll. Uh, hey, Greco, <laughs> great job. Yes, we can help you. Um, thanks so much for uh, showing up today. Really, uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time.